So the next part in example six is you got to graph it now. It's kind of, it gets hard, okay? So what I do is I just ask myself, I kind of like lightly shade what it would be. For example, x plus one, we know how to graph that. That's an equation of a line where it's going through the y-intercept of zero, one, right? We're going through the y-intercept of zero, one. And then what's our slope? Our slope is one. So we're just going up one over one, up one over one, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do kind of a light shading up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, up one, and then, you know, we're going this direction too. And I'm just going to kind of do a light shading at first. Is that okay? So there's my equation. It's very light, right? But then once I have an idea of where it needs to be going, I'm going to go back and look at the domain, okay? And that domain will say, okay, where you need to start, where you need to stop, all right? So when you look at the domain for x plus 1, it's for all values of x that are less than or equal to 3. So where is x equal to 3? 1, 2, 3, this guy? I'm going to make him solid. Why? Because he's included, right? It's x is less than or equal to. And then what values of x are less than or equal to 3? This direction to the left or this direction to the right? What values of x are less than 3? down, right? So this part of the graph is really what I want, guys. So make that nice and bold. And notice this part, my shaded part, where I went a little bit past. Sorry, that's easier to see it without that glare. See how I went a little bit past because that was past three? I'm just going to go back and erase it because I don't want anything past three for that one. Is that okay so far? So this is the line x plus one because we're crossing out the y-intercept of zero, one and we're going up one over one, up one over one, we have our line, but we have to stop at an x value of three. So I stopped at an x value of three. All right, the next chunk is really tiny. It's kind of hard to do. Do you realize that we're gonna go from three to four? So we're only gonna have a block, a width of one block. There's strict inequalities. So we're gonna use open circles at three, open circles at four. And what y value are they all at? Negative one, so it's just a constant, okay? So we're gonna go to three, one, two, three, and go down to negative one, and we're gonna do an open circle there. And then we're gonna go to four, one, two, three, four, go down to negative one, do an open circle there. But I wanna show all values between the two, so what do I still need to do? Try your best, but you're gonna shade in between the two without shading the actual circles. They needed to spread that out a little bit. They need to make that like three to six or something so you can see what we're doing. So. From negative infinity to three, we have this line x plus one. From just three to four, we're just a value of negative one. And then this one is, again, it's kind of hard to do, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna graph it lightly and then erase. Or actually, you know what we can do here? I think this might be easier. We're gonna start at four, right? So if our x is four, what would our y value be if we're using that function? What's half of four? Two. So our ordered pair is four, two, and we're going to include it because we have that. So go over four, one, two, three, four, and go up two. So that can kind of be like our starting point versus a y-intercept, correct? And then what is our slope, guys? One half. What does that mean? We're going to go up one over two from there. So we're going to go up one over two, up one over two, up, you know, you can keep going. And our graph is just going to go that direction. <coughs> so on the first one, actually, we could have done the first one the same idea, right? We could have done the same idea here. On the first one, instead of worrying about our y-intercept, we could say, okay, the most extreme value is 3. What y value is that most extreme value at? Well, 3 plus 1 is 4. And notice that's what we graphed, right? And then we had to do our slope off of that. Here, from three to four, it was constant, so we didn't really worry about it. And then the next one, we're starting at four. So at the x value of four, what was our y? Half of four was two. And then we just used our slope like normal. Up one over two, up one over two. So you guys just graph the piecewise function. And it, they could ask you the same thing um, with uh, using this. 
I'm not going to worry about using our graphing calculator to verify it, but it'd just be graphing that in Y1, Y2, 1, 3, and seeing all the different parts from, you know. Um, I'm not too sure if we can restrict the domains in those, so I'll have to ask somebody if we can make it look like that or if it would just have, like, this line, this line, and that line. All right, the last concept, guys. Woohoo! drum roll here. He's kind of interesting. Um, it's called the greatest integer function, and the definition is the greater, greatest integer less than or equal to. And that's kind of a key thing because it's kind of a tease because you have this greatest thrown at you, thinking big, big, big. But it's actually the greatest integer less than or equal to, so you actually usually round down. It's like rounding down. What the symbol is, it's like this double bracket, okay? So notice, here are some examples. If we have the greatest integer function of zero, what is the smallest number, or does everybody know what an integer is? Sorry, that's really assuming. Do you guys know integers are just those whole numbers, one, two, three, four, but including negatives, negative one, negative two, negative three, four. There's no decimals, there's no fractions, there's no partial numbers, all right? So zero. What is the biggest number that's less than or equal to zero? Zero. So if you are an integer, the greatest integer equal or less than you is you, okay? Point two. What is the greatest number, whole number, equal to or less than point two? Zero. You're rounding down, right? One-seventh. It's a fraction. If I put 1.9, what are you still putting? Or excuse me, or if I'm putting 0 0.9, what are you still putting? Zero. So you just always round down to that next integer is what we're doing. So notice that here, 3 is 3, 3.2 runs down to 3, 3, .1, 3 and 1 eighth runs down to 3, and same thing here. Negatives get kind of tricky, right, because the bigger negative is actually the smaller, okay? So negative 5 runs down to negative 5, negative 4.2 rounds down to negative 0.5, and negative 4 and 1 eighth runs down to negative 5, all right? So help me out here. What we're going to do is we're going to find f of x for when x is 4.32. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to come up with that integer that pops out and then multiply by 3 at the end. So we want f of 4.32. So we're going to have 3 on the outside of our greatest integer function. So we just ask ourselves, what number is 4.32 going to round down to? Four, okay? And so then that's going to be just 3 times 4 or 12. Um, it's interesting if you were to graph them. They look like stairs, like kind of like, because you just from basically here, from um, 4 to 5, you'd have the solid line with one solid dot and an open circle, and then you would jump up from 5 to 6, you'd have a solid line. It's kind of interesting when you graph them. The whole point of them is sometimes in real life, guys, we don't care about partial things. Um, Money, for example. If we have a bunch of pennies, or what, or fractions of pennies, we typically round, round down. So like if you go get gas and it's 213, you see that little nine? We're really just being charged 213, right? But it's a fraction of pennies, so it's rounding down to 213, that kind of thing. Or things in real life where you can't have partial things, like people, right? You can't have partial people, so you can't really find out 4.32 if the function's representing people. So the greatest integer function works for that as well, okay?